Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Commonwealth Club online program. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the club, and our moderator today. The Commonwealth Club has suspended its in person programming until it's safe. But today's program is over one of over 100 live streams we've produced in the past three months, with over 1 million views in just the past 30 days. You can view the various programs. Uh, and find upcoming online events at the Commonwealth Club's website, which is commonwealthclub.org. Please do consider donating to the club to support this programming, texting the word donate to 415-329-4231 or visiting our website. To our viewing audience, we do want you involved as always at Commonwealth Club programs. So submit questions to me via the text chat area on screen and I'll integrate as many of them as possible into the program. Please also spread the word by sharing and liking this program on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Elder abuse affects millions of people all across uh, the world and across socioeconomic levels. Isolation, mental illness, and dementia exacerbate the problem by making elders even more susceptible to those who would exploit them. Recognizing this concern, the United Nations designated June 15th, which was two days ago, as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest. To talk about this issue, Ian Clark Devine, founder and president of the Huguette Clark Foundation. The exploitation of their aunt, Uget, I, 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 I think you're going to have to correct me on the pronunciation. It, it is Uget, I think by her professional advisors and caregivers, horrified the Clark family. They were, they're all descendants of Senator William A. Clark, a copper king whose wealth in the early 20th century rivaled that of John D. Rockefeller. By the time she passed away in 2011 at age 104, Uget's attorney, accountant, and medical caretakers had manipulated her out of nearly $40 million. After this experience, the Clark family decided to protect vulnerable elders across the country, and in 2018, they established the Uget Clark Foundation to protect seniors and hold accountable those who abuse them. This is a public foundation, and the first I have heard of a foundation that is exclusively dedicated to fighting elder exploitation. Ian Clark Devine is a longtime leader in nonprofit and foundation management. He's a great grand nephew of Uget Clark. So what are the signs of elder abuse? What can be done to stop it? How are legal protections established here in California more than a decade ago and now existing in many other states performing to protect seniors and their assets? To talk about these and other issues, please join me in welcoming Ian Clark Devine. Thank you, Gloria. I'm glad to be here with you today. Uh, and yes, the correct French pronunciation is Uget, although we American cousins uh, always call her Huguet. <laughs> so either one is acceptable to us. <clears throat> so I'd like to start out by asking you, what is elder exploitation? How is it defined? Well, very simply, it's financial fraud, the financial exploitation of people over 65, um, elder financial exploitation. And we usually hear about it when an actor or an heiress or a business tycoon um, is preyed upon. Uh, recent examples in the past decade are Mickey Rooney, um, Brooke Astor. Sumner Redstone. So, um, but I, I do want to say that elder financial exploitation is an equal opportunity destroyer. It does not recognize the color of your skin or your socioeconomic status. It, it, uh, it appears in all 
areas, all geographies of our society. Um, but it's really tied to demographics. Obviously it's called elder uh, financial exploitation because we define it as affecting people over 65. Um, I think there's, yes, uh, a graph. This is a Census Bureau graph of projected population of people over 65 in America. So today, there are about 55 million people 65 and older in this country. In 10 years, there will be 72 million. And in 30 years, in the year 2050, 88 million. So it's 10,000 people turn 65 every day. The baby boom generation is maturing. The over 85 population is growing even faster. So this is a huge and growing population that is vulnerable to financial exploitation. And this is separate from uh, physical or sexual abuse of elders, which is a separate and equally horrific problem. So we're gonna talk about this through the context of your relative. Um, so uh, tell us the story of Uget Clark. Well, let's go back to 1906, 114 years ago. When Huguette was born in France, the child, uh, second child of the second wife of Senator William Andrews Clark. When Huguette was born, he was 67. Um, so a huge age difference. Uh, in, very big distance emotionally, probably, between um, Huguette and her father. Uh, she did have an older sister, uh, Andrea, who was uh, really, uh, she was so close to, um, and who died, unfortunately, as a teenager of meningitis. So she lost the, perhaps the closest person to her at a young age. Um, she had, uh, Huguette had half uh, brothers and sisters from Senator Clark's first wife, first marriage, who died. And those, I'm descended from uh, one, the eldest daughter of that marriage. But they were much older. They had kids and even grandchildren already. So there's this generational mismatch uh, between siblings. So Huguette, um, Grew up, sheltered life, uh, traveled, houses, New York, Paris, Montana. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a life of privilege. Servants. She grew up. She, her father died. The senator died in 1926, uh, when, 1925, when she was 19. <clears throat> So that was another big loss in her life. Um, then she moved in with her mother. And though she was briefly married, um, she lived most of her life, her, her entire life with her mother. Her mother grew increasingly deaf and eventually died in 1963 when Huguette was 57. Now Huguette was alone. <clears throat> And although she was, um, she never really lived independently. Um, she was quite intelligent, but she was socially awkward. Um, and so she was last seen in public at a family funeral at St. Thomas More in New York City in 1967 and she was never seen in public again, and she died in 2011. Now there's much more to her story <laughs> that I'm sure we'll get into. And a little bit about her father, again, depending on how you counted wealth at, in around 1900 or so, either he or John D. Rockefeller were the richest men in the United States. Um, that's what they say. 
Um, in, in some ways, most traces of Senator Clark have uh, disappeared. Um, he had a grand mansion on Fifth Avenue that was torn down shortly after he died. Um, he had mostly uh, daughters, so the name uh, disappeared. Uh, after he died, all his various interests, and he, he made his money in mining, but he was uh, also uh, dabbled in real estate. Um, Clark County, Nevada, where Las Vegas is, is named after him. He, railroads and banking, all that was sold off after he died. There was no heir to run the business. So um, most, most traces of public traces of Senator Clark uh, disappeared in the 20s and 30s. So here's Ugat at 57 years old. Her father has died a long time ago. Her mother passes away. She's never really left home. What happens to her then? Well, she lived, um, she and her mother lived in the, actually three apartments in one building in, on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Um, she, Huguette, lived there alone. She had an older, old woman um, who had been with the family as a helper for many, many years who came in and helped her out. Um, I think uh, after, um, after she was seen at the Clark family funeral in 1967, I think she never left her apartment for 24 years. And I mean, literally never left her apartment for 24 years. Um, she came, uh, what, what caused this whole um, uh, nightmare was that she had developed a, a facial cancer that interfered with her eating. And she, um, she dropped to 75 pounds. She lived in her nightgown and was near death. She, she, for whatever reason, couldn't herself call for help. But her lady helper, um, another elderly lady, finally called a doctor. And the doctor found Huguette. And his notes called her an apparition, living in a chaotic apartment, messy apartment lit by candles. And she was probably days from death. So she went to the hospital where they were able to cure her facial cancer uh, in a matter of months and bring her back to health. At that point, for whatever reason, she did not want to return to her apartments, her own apartments. Um, Maybe the memories were too strong, who knows. But she chose willingly to stay in the hospital, to live at the hospital, and the hospital agreed. Um, so the last 20 years of her life, she lived in a hospital, Beth Israel Medical Center. And even though she was paying private room rates, $300,000 a year for her room, even though she was in relatively good health. She was slowly transferred from an upper floor Riverview room down to the third floor interior room, and finally to an interior room that looked out on an air shaft. And um, the whole time she was 
surrounded by an attorney, an accountant, private duty nurses, doctors, and hospital personnel. And so um, what ensued then in terms of her, how, how was she exploited financially? Well, I, I'll describe it in rather graphic terms. It was like hyenas, jackals, and buzzards feeding on a still living carcass for 20 years. It started with her nurse, her private duty nurse who was picked at random to take care of her. They quickly created a relationship where the nurse had almost complete control and began um, a series of uh, 20 years of asking for gifts. Um, there was one period, a 12 month period, where Huguette wrote 46 checks for $10 million to the nurse. It was, it was for tuition, apartments, houses, a Bentley. The nurse got jewelry. The nurse was given a Stradivarius violin. All she had to do was ask, and Huguette gave. And actually, later on, under um, testimony under oath, the nurse claimed, I could get Madame to do anything. Now, just pause for a second. It's been uh, said and written that Uget was a bit simple-minded, was a bit naive. Um, did she have dementia? Was she mentally ill? Was she uh, simple-minded? That, that's an excellent question, and we'll never know. Um, we'll never know because the hospital, Beth Israel, refused to do any sort of cognitive tests, uh, any sort of testing. And this from a woman who was near death and couldn't call for help. Um, I, I think what I didn't know you get, I saw her once in her hospital bed, but uh, I don't claim to know her. Um, she was always very shy and reclusive, very um, socially awkward. So um, I don't think she had dementia because uh, what, I've, what the family's been able to uncover is that she was very talented at uh, film photography, you know, with apertures and f-stops. She was um, skilled at architecture um, for dollhouses. Um, she could recite poems that she had learned as a kid in French and Spanish. Um, so I, she, was, she seemed to be aware of current events. So I don't think um, dementia was part of the issue. I do suspect, and I'm, again, I'm not an expert, but I do suspect that she was somewhere on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. And because that all seems to fit. One of her doctors at the hospital um, claimed in an email to his colleagues, he said, this woman has no concept of money. And I think that's true. Unfortunately, the doctor proceeded to um, get about $2 million out of her. Yeah, so tell us about what happened with the hospital, what happened with the doctors, the attorney, the accountant. Uh, you mentioned, you know, hyenas, you know, uh, at vultures, et cetera. So this was a whole circle around her. And that's the really horrifying thing. This was a, a circle of professionals who were exploiting Huguette. They each knew what the other was doing and sometimes coordinated their efforts to get more money for themselves um, out of Huguette. So 
um, the, the nurse, as I said, I think started the whole process, um, gained some sort of emotional sway over Huguette and was able to manipulate her out of money. Others saw what was going on. The hospital, Beth Israel, was in bad financial straits and they, um, with their development department, would uh, coordinate fundraising trips to Huguette's bedside. Just imagine that for a, a minute. Uh, where the president and chairman of the hospital come to Huguette's bed and say they can guarantee her safety and well being only if she gives them $125 million. Um, the lawyer and the accountant saw what was going on. They got into the act too. Um, they were each getting great fees for their services. Um, they managed to get annual uh, gifts. Um, and, and then when we get to the story of the wills, that's where they really tried to cash in. And meanwhile, her doctors um, were self-dealing. Um, Huguette's uh, personal physician was able to convince her to pay his medical malpractice bills. Uh, he threatened uh, to stop uh, taking care of her unless she went to uh, a hospital of his choosing. This is when the original hospital she was in was sold and was going to be torn down for an apartment building. So she had to move. And he said he wouldn't uh, take care of her unless he moved closer to where he lived. So... <laughs> Where was the family during all of this? I'm trying to envision, since she was pretty alone in the world, what would be the alternative scenario for her? So what did the family do? Where was the family in all of this? Um, how, how did your family relate to this? That's, that's really good uh, because the family, the older members of the family, uh, the generation above me, uh, was in touch with her uh, through phone calls and letters. They stayed in touch. Um, but eventually they died off. That generation died off as Huguette kept living and living. And then the, my generation, um, and I'm 67, um, really had no contact with you get her knowledge, personal knowledge of her. Um, so that sort of family contact was broken. At, towards the end, the lawyer um, uh, was asked, asked the family to call him when they wanted, when we wanted to speak to you get, and she, he would give her the message and she would call us. And that, that's the way that worked. And when we wanted to, not me personally, but other members of my family, uh, cousins wanted to visit, he always said, she's fine, but she doesn't want to see you. Now, we had no way of knowing whether that was true or not. Uh, and interestingly, interestingly enough, um, she didn't want people to know that she was in a hospital. So mm -hmm. she always pretended that she was at home and everything was fine but she was living in a hospital in a dark room with the windows shades drawn. So, so um, tell us about, uh, there was an attempt for a guardianship, I believe at one point, uh, was there an attempt to intervene yeah. in this? Um, there, there was, and if you have that, um, there's a slide of tabloid headlines. If you could, put that up. Um, in 2009, um, there was um, the New York City tabloids got a hold of this. Um, and s these lurid headlines began appearing all summer long in 2009. The family was really very upset 
We were calling each other, trying to figure out what to do. We were talking to lawyers. What were our options? And um, finally, we got word. A reporter called uh, one of our lawyers and said, uh, the New York City District Attorney's Office wants the family to file a guardianship petition. Well, that's, that's all the push we needed. Uh, so we fi filed um, a guardianship petition, which is hard work. It's, uh, the standard of proof is quite high. Um, we, the family asked for two things. One is that an independent uh, company take over Huguette's financial affairs. And two, that the court appoint an independent investigator to find out what was going on. And this is something that uh, courts do all the time. So we file a petition. For some reason, it was dismissed out of hand uh, on a technicality. No, no independent investigator was appointed. And one of the reasons given was that we didn't have any proof. Well, the headlines were driving everybody crazy and we, we didn't know what was going on. We wanted to find out. But having the guardianship petition denied sort of stopped the family cold. We had no other options. We had a stonewalling lawyer who was telling us everything was fine and Huguette didn't want to talk to us. And we, we had run out of options. We had to wait until Hugh got died. Then, at that then, point, and then what happened? <laughs> then, then the story of the wills began. Um, the, the family, the Clark family, which was basically nineteen relatives, cousins, uh, second and third cousins, who were the senior most members of each family line as legally those were the only people who had legal standing to question anything so there were 19 elderly family members at the top of the family tree who got together somewhere in california somewhere on the east coast there's a whole branch of the family in france all got together all hired a lawyer to figure out what was going on so when Huguette died, her lawyer um, had the legal obligation of sending the latest will to uh, everybody who was mentioned. For some reason, he not only sent the latest version, but the prior version written six weeks earlier. And these were the only wills that Huguette ever signed. Her whole life, she had actively resisted attempts by all her lawyers, and she outlived most of her lawyers, um, she, she resisted attempts to uh, write a will. So here over the machine uh, comes copies, PDFs of two wills. The, the first will, um, the earlier will, was very simple. It left a few bequests, and left the bulk of her estate to the family, to the Clark family. The second will, written six weeks later, was much more complex. And it named the uh, attorney and the accountant as paid co-executors. They each got $500,000 bequests, and they were each named as trustees paid trustees of a foundation um, whose asset, main asset was her uh, 28 acre estate in Santa Barbara, California, Bella Guarda. The difference between these two wills was mind boggling. Nobody could figure out how one led to the other. They were radically different. Um, at that point, the family decided we needed um, 
an experienced, uh, a law firm experienced in estate litigation. And our, actually our French cousins suggested uh, a guy named John Morkin of Farrell Fritz, who it turned out to be the best decision we could make. He was brilliant. He, he understood the situation. Um, he was horrified by the abuse that Huguette had suffered. And he was able to work with 19, <laughs> uh, 19 cousins over nine time zones. So then thus began the great uh, probate challenge, which the family mounted. Uh, and that was really, a, it turned into a, almost a circus. Um, the, uh, every party named in the will had their own lawyer. Um, the, um, there were some really odd things, the conflicts where the estate was also was represented by a firm who also represented the lawyer who was accused of bilking the estate. So um, these things were allowed to happen in the system. Um, there was also participation by the New York State Attorney General's Office, the Division of Charities, because the second will had created a foundation, mm -hmm. which in the will was clearly a bogus sham foundation meant for the enrichment of the accountant and the uh, attorneys. Um, and and they, were, they, were <laughs> they were named as board members or something of this they, foundation? They were, yeah, they, they were paid board members and they were allowed to uh, charge the foundation for services, accounting and legal services. It was totally a sham. And her accountant was a sex offender, as I recall? I didn't even want to go there, but the family, um, thank goodness for Google, um, in 2008, we had a, a family gathering. One of the cousins Googled who this accountant was, a guy named Irving Kamsler, who was coming to this gathering at the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington. Who is this guy? It turns out he had just been convicted on 15 counts of um, uh, sending indecent material uh, to a minor. Uh, he was trying to set up, uh, he had met a 13 year old girl on one occasion and a 15 year old girl on another. And he was trying, trying to uh, set up uh, times to get together with them and he was sending them dirty pictures. Fortunately, for us, the 13 year old and the 15 year old girls were actually cyber crime police officers. Uh, and he was convicted of 15 counts, uh, but allowed to practice. So he went right back to work for Aunt Huguette. Horrifying. So, so, in total, how much did these people make off with before the will, before your aunt died and the will came before the court? Uh, it's, it's really, it's hard to say, but somewhere between 35 and $40 million. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of that happened, um, long before she died. So questions of statute of limitation may have applied, um, when the accountant forgot to file gift taxes or generation skipping taxes, and he forgot to pay them, well, those don't have statute of limitations. And those oversights by the accountant cause, uh, cost the estate vast amounts of money and lots of time arguing with tax authorities. Um, so, so you went to court, what was the outcome? And then let's talk about lessons and remedies from all this. <laughs> well, uh, we went to court, the family went to court 
and um, eventually it was settled. There was a settlement in 2013. And I will say that the settlement um, was the best possible outcome. It was a victory for the family in that we opened up this horrible uh, case of exploitation for the world to see. The um, lawyer and the accountant uh, had to give up all these goodies that they wrote for themselves in the will. The nurse had to give back $5 million. Uh, and a legitimate foundation, a legitimate Bella Guardo Foundation was actually created. So uh, that, that was all, all good. Um, you know, I, the only regret is that I wish it had gone to trial. Um, that would have cost lots more money and taken lots more time, but it also would have fully exposed um, all, all the misdeeds. Um, but really, the settlement was the best option for everybody. So was there any criminal prosecution of these professionals and others? No, no, they, the settlement included, um, let them, let them walk, <laughs> so to speak. So there are some basic concepts here that are, uh, part of elder law and, uh, the, the, the ethos of caring for older person, the concept of undue influence, the concept of capacity. Were those part of the case that you made? Yes, um, the undue influence uh, certainly um, was a, a big part of it. And for your audience, uh, undue influence in simple terms is just a vulnerability. Um, of an elder uh, to agreements and transfers and bequests that are detrimental to that person. And they usually benefit somebody else. The, the underlying real world condition that allows undue influence to occur is isolation. Um, when an older person is isolated, uh, without contact, um, then they become much more vulnerable to emotional manipulation. So undue influence is a psychological process, and it's it's difficult to prove, um, except in to the sense that um, things happen that are detrimental to the elder and benefit somebody else. Capacity is different. It's really the cognitive ability to understand things, understand the meaning of decisions. And that, um, luckily medicine has progressed to the point where there are tests that can determine um, cognitive ability. The underlying um, issue with cognitive ability is quite often dementia, Alzheimer's disease or traumatic brain injury um, that affect uh, thinking, reasoning, um, just basic uh, conceptual understanding concepts. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I, I've heard that uh, studies show that um, simple, um, uh, losing the ability to do simple math is one of the earliest signs of um, loss of capacity, uh, whether it's balancing a checkbook or just simple working on a recipe or something. Um, that, can, that can show uh, Alzheimer's and dementia before a clinical diagnosis can actually be made. So that's a, these are cues that everybody, uh, financial professionals, um, uh, health care aides and family members should be alert for. So um, what should the, a professional do who is involved with an elderly person 
um, how how should these professionals have conducted themselves? What kind of oversight or you know self uh, monitoring should they have been, done? Well, in Huguette's case, which is an extreme example. Um, you know, every profession has its code of ethics. They have standards that are meant to be followed. Everybody around you get shredded every ethical standard that they were supposed to uphold. Um, so there, the not only did the individuals personally fail in their duties, but uh, the system behind them also failed to spot it uh, or even punish it after the fact. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm the head of a nonprofit, the Commonwealth Club, and we raise a fair amount of money. And there was a time a few years ago when um, a member of our board who was in his 90s uh, was trying to make some estate plans involving our organization. And I actually was contacted by a care manager for him uh, saying, you know, he wanted to talk to me and so on. And I was, it, um, my instinct at the time was th that I was uncomfortable with this uh, and that a care manager to the 90 something year old person was not really a channel I wanted to be in. Uh, so I immediately contacted his son, who I, I knew of, and brought his son into it. And the whole thing got done. And his son is on our board today. The, the man has passed away some years ago. And so I felt like the, the immediate thing to do was reach out to a younger family member and check out what was going on. Well, Gloria, that's exactly the right thing to do, is to involve other people. Um, now, in, in our case, the family, uh, the Clark family of cousins got together and were uh, asking each other questions, looking for answers. And that's what people should do. They should um, talk to the parent um, or the aunt or uncle um, directly to see what's going on. They should talk to their siblings. They should talk to the caregivers in an open conversation where everybody knows what's going on. It's much harder to commit uh, financial fraud when there are multiple people aware of what's going on and can provide different perspectives and different sort of checks and balances. So yes, bringing other family members in, asking tough questions of caregivers or people who have powers of attorney, um, not taking no for an answer. And because it's, it's the family's right to know um, what's going on. They can't be shut out. Um, so I think having, having a group of family members and caregivers uh, work with each other uh, in an open relationship is the best possible way of uh, ensuring the health, financial health and physical health of an elder. How does the legal and social structure work now? This problem of elder financial exploitation has become much better known. Some states have legislation. There are uh, mandated reporters, banks, and so on uh, are supposed to report if an elderly person comes in with somebody and they get a feeling that perhaps they are, you know, being influenced to write checks. H how has this evolved since the time that you were involved with your uh, Aunt Uget's situation? Well, I'm glad to report that it has uh, evolved quite rapidly. Um, and um, this is a, it's sort of a fragmented state by state issue where every state, um, as we've seen in the COVID uh, pandemic, the states have the authority to make their own rules. Um, and that's, uh, 
that's been a bit of a problem. On the federal level, I know your audience knows that this is such a political time where every issue is politicized, but I, I want to um, compliment there's a Senate uh, Select Committee on Aging that has worked uh, together bipartisanly. It's uh, chaired by Susan Collins of Maine, and the, the ranking member is Kristen Sinema, um, and before her, Claire McCaskill. This is a group that has worked together to pass legislation, like the Senior Safe Act, um, which is really, it's non-political, and it has done a lot to help uh, the status of elders. And you, you mentioned uh, about banks, uh, tellers, uh, banks, it give, uh, the Senior Safe Act gives financial institutions, banks, credit unions, um, like uh, immunity from prosecution if they report uh, suspected cases of elder fraud. Um, provided that their employees undergo training in how to spot it and what to do. So this has been a boon. It's gotten the financial services industry to get, be much more comfortable giving out what was before confidential information that they would be held liable for, um, giving it to the proper authorities. Um, um, in California, I believe there's legislation that has created the presu presumption that if a caregiver or a professional, such as an accountant or an attorney, is named in a will or a state plan, that it's assumed to have been the result of undue influence. Yes, that uh, um, California has been one of the leaders, leading states in developing forward-looking elder justice legislation. Um, the Clark family created the foundation that you mentioned at the beginning of the program. One of our uh, grants um, was to develop a set of model civil law provisions um, that cherry picked sort of the best practices, the best laws from various states, many of them from California, um, and present it as um, sort of a menu of options for states, all 50 states, to, to adapt to their own needs. Thank you for bringing up the Uget Clark Foundation, which resulted as a result of all your family getting together and deciding to do something about this problem. Uh, tell us a little more about what it does. Well, thank you. The um, Huguette Clark Foundation is a very small public charity. It's a 501c3. Um, we uh, make small grants that are intended to be transformational, that are intended to lead to structural or institutional change. Um, so we, we follow sort of a venture philanthropy model, making very small, very targeted um, grants. Uh, our average grant is about $50,000. So we're not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. We're talking about very effective uh, small grants that can have an outsized impact. Um, so we've made nine grants in the past seven years. Um, to a variety of really interesting organizations. Um, we, we focus on three main areas, which is sort of better tools and training for people in the elder justice field. We try to encourage meaningful collaboration of experts. Um, and thirdly, on improvement of services for victims. So we've, we've sponsored um, roundtables among experts. And you probably know in the philanthropic field, like many, um, like many areas of business and government, everything's in a silo. 
<laughs> and people don't coordinate with others. So we brought together um, uh, experts from across the country who know each other by reputation, but didn't maybe didn't know each other personally. And um, that sort of um, meeting acts as a catalyst for new ideas. They uh, discover unmet needs. Um, so that's the type of thing um, that we fund. Uh, if I can talk about one more or two more, um, <laughs> we funded, um, again, um, financial services industries and brokerage firms were loath to give out client information to authorities. So several years ago, we created a, for banks, a bank protocol. And really what it is, is just a sheet of paper, a grant funding a sheet of paper. But what that does, it changes the mindset. It shows banks um, and their uh, legal departments, their HR departments, that not only do they, uh, is it uh, allowable and permissible for them uh, to give out this information, but it shows them how to do it. And it's very simple. We, we did it for the banking industry. We're doing it for the brokerage industry um, in conjunction with the uh, brokerage um, industry trade group. And it's really having an effect. There's been a mental shift and a behavioral shift in these financial services industries. They recognize the problem. Uh, they, they want to do the right thing. And uh, so th that's the type of structural change that we're pushing. You know, um, some people might say, well, okay, your great aunt was very wealthy so what if money went to some of her money went to attorneys and accountants and and so on? Uh, one of the questions that fascinates me is uh, the difference that can be made in the way that funds are directed. So instead of paying for her lawyer's malpractice insurance, what is what who gets money doing now? How is it being put to use? Well. Um most of her um, assets, you know, at the end of the day, there wasn't that much money left over. She she had uh, a lot of real estate that was sold. Uh, probably the prime asset was the Bellis Gordo estate, which is now the home of the Bellis Gordo Foundation in Santa Barbara. Um, and what does it do? It is an arts foundation. Um, and I happen to sit, be a founding board member uh, on that. It is still in the process of uh, getting up to speed, but it has, uh, I think, a really great future supporting the arts in Southern California, not as a museum, um, but as a, a venue and um, supporting the arts culture in uh, Southern California. Um, unfortunately, the foundation has suffered from legal delays in closing the estate and wrapping everything up. The tax issues that I referred to kept the foundation from really getting started. But now, now it's on its way. Um, I have heard so many stories. Your your great aunt's story is probably the most extreme case in this in the United States of elder financial exploitation. But I have heard so many stories from so many people and families um, about uh, elder financial abuse. One of our audience members wants to know if you think a senior is being exploited financially, what do you do? Who do you talk to? Where do you go? Um, that's a good, great question. I think the, the first thing you do is try and talk to the person, the victim, uh, him or herself. Um, quite often, uh, be, because there's so much shame and embarrassment 
and guilt wrapped up in being exploited, that that it may not take you very far. Um, you can call adult protective services. Uh, every state or city has an adult protective services division. They can advise you or even send somebody to check. If you have real proof of uh, fraud or abuse, you can go to the police. Um, but police quite often require hard evidence before they will uh, respond. Um, those, those are the, the ways of, of getting, um, getting involved, trying to uncover the truth. It's all about getting to the truth. Um, one thing um, you can do is help um, help the, the victim, your parent, or whoever you suspect is being abused, help that person get a credit report. Because quite often that will turn up um, something, like a drop in a credit rating is a big red flag that something is going on. Uh, it's a simple thing, it takes 15 minutes. Any other steps you would recommend? Um, well, you have to be sort of on the lookout for changes, uh, changes in behavior. That's, that's a red flag. Um, changes in bank accounts, um, sudden transfers or gifts, um, unexplained disappearances of funds or valuables. Sometimes it's... Uh, a distant relative who shows up or a new, a new friend who um, is the victim's new best friend. Um, these, those, these are the types of changes um, that to be on the lookout for. You know, a lot of times, you know, the two sort of two different ways that two different types of people who commit this fraud, uh, one group is total strangers, and they can be, I'm sure your audience has heard of all these scams, the Nigerian prince who has $10 million that he needs help giving you, foreign lotteries. Um, there are social security and IRS imposters who demand money, and all they need to solve, to settle this issue is your bank account and the password. There are sweetheart scams for an isolated, um, vulnerable elder, suddenly who they meet online. Um, this is the person who understands them, who gets into a little trouble and needs some money. Um, sweetheart scams average about $100,000 each. So you can see the victims are just incredibly reticent to talk about uh, falling for these things. Um, but most often, the perpetrator is closer to home. It's a known family member. 58% of financial abuse is committed by a family member. Um, beyond that, non-family health care providers um, are a significant minority of fraud. And then there are the professional advisors. That was Hugh Getz's situation. People who have guardianship powers and powers of attorney, which are very useful things, but they're double-edged swords because they can be abused um, to drain a person's assets. You also mentioned Hugh Gett. I mean, she's an old, white, wealthy woman, who cares, right? But the fact of elder abuse is that it can occur at the very lowest socioeconomic levels where the loss of $5,000 to somebody means their entire life savings. When a person who's 
going off to a nursing home or assisted living sells his house to a home health care aide for a fraction of its value. So these are the types of things. They affect everybody. And yes, when I first went through this, I was sort of embarrassed to talk about it myself, even though I'm not a victim. But when I did, every other person would say, you know, that same thing happened to someone in my family. So just talking about it uncovers this world of um, abuse that's out there. Uh, and it's very beneficial to talk about it um, and help each other through this crisis that can destroy families. And I've had the same experience as you. The stories I helped take care of a, a distant elderly relative, you know, just helping sort out her situation and get her into assisted living. And as I did that, one of her neighbors told me that, you know, she was, somebody was calling her and getting her to wire money through Western Union to someplace in Las Vegas or someplace that and the money was disappearing and repeatedly and she had no idea, you know, she was a nice person who was telling her she needed to be doing this. So in my experience, it is rampant. Um, so I assume that you would advise families to keep an eye on their older members. It sound, there seems often in this kind of situation an effort to kind of move the family away, keep them away with your aunt you get, you know, she didn't want people to know she was at the hospital for years, but maybe somebody should have been pushier to get through that wall of attorneys and accountants and the hospitals and so on. Absolutely. And um, in this current environment of coronavirus and isolation and stay at home guidelines, that has really made, um, it's opened the door for scammers. Uh, I, I have read that uh, incidents of financial fraud have increased uh, significantly in the past few months as elders become more isolated and hence more vulnerable to pressure. Well, um, this has been a fascinating discussion. I, I would love to engage in this for a long, much lo longer with you, Ian. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, pursuing the case with your elderly relative or for your family doing that because it has dramatized the, pro uh, the problem as few other cases could. And thank you for your family taking the funds and putting them to good causes like the Arts Foundation in Santa Barbara and also your foundation uh, into uh, working practically on this problem of combating elder financial exploitation. So uh, this is the end of our program and the end of our time. Thank you again, Ian. Uh, thank you to all our viewers online. As I noted, the club is going to continue these online programs for as long as our shelter at home uh, time uh, lasts and, and probably thereafter as well. So please visit us regularly at commonwealthclub.org to learn more and to donate if you wish. And uh, I'm Gloria Duffy again. Again, thank you so much, Ian. Thank you. And now this online program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. <laughs>